So last night we uh, we went into more detail about the the conflict between the realists and the sophists, and we also did so a little bit going into our our own contemporary situation and thinking thinking about the whole the whole way in which alliances can be formed and broken in political life. And what I'd like to do tonight is I would like to, I think, correct what I, I'm pretty sure is a gap in your philosophical formation. And it's also, it's a gap in your philosophical formation. And I think it's a gap that actually prevents many people from, <clears throat> from understanding maybe getting to the root of some of our contemporary difficulties. And I think it's a gap in your formation because I've talked with the professors who have taught contemporary philosophy. And they have not taught this figure and his influence in their courses. But I also think that to understand our, our contemporary circumstances, we need to understand especially this figure and his influence. Saul Absolutely not. Saul Alinsky is complete misdirection. That's, that's precisely my point. That is precisely my point. Saul Alinsky is complete misdirection. He was just a charlatan. He's just a stooge. <laughs> he's just a false, he's a false cause of the, of the difficulties we're going through. <clears throat> Saul Alinsky. Oh. He's like an intellectual proletariat. <laughs> he was just a charlatan. I mean, you know, actually, I know a supernumerary. He trained the supernumerary to be a community organizer. But he was, not, he was not an intellectual. He was not a man of ideas. He was a man that, you know, he went to the dock workers in Chicago in the early, in the 1920s or so, and he developed a method for organizing dock workers to get higher wages. No, 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 no I, I, was hoping, I was hoping someone would say that name. <laughs> you, I drew you right into my trap. <laughs> Right? <clears throat> because so, so Saul, I mean, Saul Linsky was a charlatan and he, you know, he knew how to extort money out of people, but his whole, his whole method was not an ideal. It was, it was not an ideology. He was just very good, but he was, but so actually there are things you can learn from Saul Linsky because he was all about procedures. What do you do? How do you enter into a situation where you have a bunch of people that are so at odds with each other they're unwilling to organize politically so as to ask what for injustice is probably theirs, like a higher wage. Right, so the first thing he did is he organized dock workers. What he taught this, this, this fellow that he taught was not a supernumerary when Saul Linsky taught him. But what he taught, what he taught Squire Lance was like, how do you organize? So if the, if the, if the people in your department, if, pe if the people who run your apartment building if they're not fixing the, electri the electricity and they're not fixing the plumbing problems, how do you make life, life difficult for them so that they fix the electricity and the plumbing in the apartment building, right? Or if you're going to the local grocery store and the owners of the grocery stores are putting weights in the scales so as to overcharge you for vegetables, how do you organize against them to demand fair, <laughs> you know, fair price on vegetables? <clears throat> Saul Alinsky and his followers, for, and just to give you a sense how anti-ideological they were, in 1966, when Martin Luther King came to Marquette Park in Chicago, Saul Alinsky and his followers were against... So this, 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 uh, this supernumerary was a black supernumerary in Chicago. He was a community organizer in Chicago. They were against Martin Luther King coming to Chicago. Because one of Saul Alinsky's principles was that whenever you protest, you have to have something very specific in mind that you're protesting for. Like you have to, some, you have, to have something you're willing to, nego go, to the, go to the table and negotiate for. You can't just protest for some general amorphous ideal, right? So, so they actually protested against, they were with the, they were on the side of the Lithuanians against Martin Luther King marching and coming to Marquette Park. Because they basically said, you're, you're bringing an ideology here. You, you, don't, you don't know anything about local, local Chicago politics. You're just going to ruin 
what we've tried to build up for the last 10 or 15 years. So <clears throat> I want to, in order to, does that, does that answer your question? <laughs> Who's the gap, though? Who's the gap? Yeah. Well, we're going to get to that. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, but I think to understand the gap, we need to understand what, the, you know, part of what is justice, right? Justice is giving to each his due. That's the first book of the Republic. And I think that's, that's, the, that's the definition Aquinas, Aristotle and Aquinas eventually seize on as being, this is, the def- this is the right definition of judge- justice, giving to each his due. Now justice can be me towards a fellow citizen, it can be me towards the government, or it can be the government towards me and the fellow citizens. Right, those are the, so justice by its nature is social. <laughs> so, so to say social justice in a way is a, you're saying the same thing twice, right? Because justice by its nature involves more than one person, which is social, or more than one person and one institution. So when people say social justice, they don't mean, they mean actually one, I think, I think most people when they say social justice, what they mean is the justice that the government owes to the citizens, right? So when you have when you when you're so the, the one of the one of the fundamental divides about justice is what determines justice. <clears throat> if we go back to our initial uh, description of deviancy, so <clears throat> if you let's just say the Ten Commandments, the moral order, the moral law, the natural law, the natural law is how humans participate in the eternal law, the divine law, which is written, right, is the written basically the Ten Commandments is the full expression of the natural law. If someone's using their reason properly, they should come to the content of the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> so in a, in a well-ordered society, the Ten Commandments are the norm. And then everything that's against the Ten Commandments would be deviant. If you start to reject any, one, any of the Ten Commandments and replace them with your own morality, that's the origin of what we, I would call political correctness. That's like a morality prime that you create to, to basically try to place, the, let's say, that commandment that you reject in the category of deviancy, but nature abhors a vacuum, so you've got to put something in its place. Right? So that's, that's, how, that's how anti-morality is created. So this comes to a head in, in the Republic because in, in Thrasymachus, right? Everybody... Who's gone to Dallas? Reads the Republic, I'm sure. <clears throat> and essentially, the Thrasymachus has two arguments against Socrates about justice. Number one, and one is based on power, and one is based on well, one is based on economics. But is, but but they're both based on contract, because the, uh, the contract in the in a society is what determines who gets what, <laughs> right? The contract is. And I'm not speaking here about social contract, right? That's that's Locke, that's Hobbes and Locke. That's much later on. But the contract is what determines what is the nature of this relationship. Therefore, who is owed what? What is due to each person in this relationship? And so Thrasymachus essentially says, in the case of power, <clears throat> what is just is what is determined by the stronger. Right? And so the just can, can confect circumstances in such a way that the unjust will suffer in, in the contract. And they will, ha- they will basically either enjoy suffering, they will put up with it and enjoy it, or they will have to accept it. Because the, 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 the powerful are powerful enough to determine the terms of justice, right? to set the mode of discourse, to set the terms of discourse. The second example that, that Thrasymachus gives is essentially economic. In other words, the, the unjust man in good times is able to arrange the social, the contract in society such that he benefits, that he profits from the labor of the weaker man. The stronger man can set the terms of the contract in the society such that when things are going well, he benefits from the labor of the weaker man. And then, 
when things go bad and the contract has to be broken, the stronger man is able to set the terms such that he benefits and the weaker man has to suffer the consequences of the broken contract. That's the principle, that's the guiding principle of usury. That was, the, that, was the, that was the guiding principle of usury in the ancient world. The German economist Heinrich Pesch, I think, has many writings that kind of flesh this out. <clears throat> then, <clears throat> at the beginning of Book Two in the Republic, Adamantus and Glaucon, they kind of pick up the argument of Socrates, and they, they essentially say, they essentially say that unless Socrates can prove to them that there's justice, and by the way, by, by Book Two of the Republic, Socrates has not defended this definition of justice which I just gave you, giving to each his due. Right? So Glaucon and Adamantus at the beginning of Book Two, they're not quite sure that Socrates would even defend that definition. But they do say, if there is no justice, what should we do? We should set up clubs, right? And in those clubs from behind the scenes, we should basically use advertising, propaganda, the imperial media, film, television, and theater, the radio, whatever, the news, right? We should use that in order to, we, it, would be, it would be better for us just to spend our lives using these clubs behind the scenes in order to define what justice is. In other words, to control society that way. <clears throat> and that's what, that's what Socrates ultimately is arguing against in the Republic. And this is part of a tradition, of the, of the Sophist tradition, but also the, in the, Thucydides recognizes in his book, The History of the Peloponnesian War, where he basically says one of the problems with, the, with Athens is the clubs and the factions that worked behind the scenes. They could never agree with each other on what policy they should carry out in order to defeat the Spartans. Right? But, but implied, implied in that statement of, Th of Thucydides is that the actual organization of, of, of Athens was, a, was an oligarchy with the facade of a democracy, with the trappings of democracy. And that it was the clubs, the oligarchic clubs behind the scenes that were determining the political, economic, and military policies of Athens. <clears throat> so I think one thinker who in the early 20th century really understands this well and explains it very well in a modern context was Thorstein Veblen. He was a Minnesota product. And he says, for example, one of the things you see in politics all the time, which is part of advertising, which is kind of modern, he doesn't call it modern sophistry because he wasn't a, he wasn't a plate. He actually, uh, it was actually quite, quite interesting that I, when I was in Rome, I used Veblen a lot for my, my dissertation in Rome. And at one point, my dissertation advisor was really, he was really pressing me like, tell me more about Veblen. Tell me his intellectual background, right? Tell me, give me a little bit of a bio biographical sketch of the man. <clears throat> and in doing so, I realized that uh, Veblen actually, so many people, there, there was this obscure German, there was this obscure German thinker in the late 19th century who thought that real political philosophy would be some sort of a fusion of, of good social science plus good philosophy. Because with good social science, you can describe society. And with good philosophy, you can direct that social science to the true and the good and the beautiful. And I forget that German's name. But I remember it was kind of funny that as because because he's kind of an obscure figure at least from our standpoint. <clears throat> so, but when I was reading, when I did more research into this guy Thorstein Veblen, the guy who was writing him about him said, "Thorstein Veblen is the American version of this German philosopher that, that my dissertation director had written his thesis on." Mm -hmm. So, so that was a very helpful footnote. <laughs> but Veblen at one point says that part of the purpose. Veblen wrote this, these one, he wrote a great book on the leisure class, the theory of the leisure class. And he also had a great book, uh, uh, what was it called now? I'm blanking on it. Anyway, he, he wrote several very good books. Well, Absentee Ownership. But essentially, Veblen in his book, he fleshes out a description of how do clubs govern from behind the scenes. <clears throat> 
right? Or the, or the modern equivalent of ancient clubs. How do they govern from behind the scenes? And one way they do that is through, is through sophistry, right? And one of the principles of sophistry is whenever you're trying to convince people of things, you hide what is true and you suggest what is false, right? So something is true, like you're about to do something evil, you hide that from the public. And then you suggest something that's false, that you're about to do something that's good, <laughs> right? And that's, I think, I think that's, a, he, he, when, he, when, he, when, when he explains it, it, it makes a lot of sense. So I think you can reasonably argue that for all the defects of Western, sci Western civilization, from the fall of Rome until, until, let's say, the Protestant Reformation, <clears throat> I think you can make an argument that people did dastardly things, people fell into sin, there was a lot of brutality here and there, but that there was this standard of, that, that there was a kind of philosophical standard that guided men's behavior. Right? That men could ultimately be held accountable to the true and the good. I think Machiavelli comes out around and Machiavelli says there's a way to manipulate evil to gain power, and that's all a leader should be concerned about. And I think it's around the time of the Reformation that Machiavelli's political philosophy gains currency in the West and fundamentally changes how politics is done. So there are some attempts, one of them I think is Hobbes and Locke, to kind of mitigate the brutality of the Machiavellian political philosophy. I think the Lockean version of that is essentially, well, let's just declare religious freedom for everybody but atheists and Catholics, because then the religions will war against each other and neutralize each other. <clears throat> and then from that standpoint, we can then have just everybody pursue protection of their property and the material interests, and that will pacify society. So Lockeanism is kind of like a lukewarm truce. And modern liberalism, I think, really stems from Lockeanism. It's a kind of variant on Lockeanism, especially in our country. But by the time you get to Nietzsche, you, and, and especially in the 19th century, you get all these thinkers that rise up that essentially say this kind of moderate Liberalism in whatever, in whatever form it exists, whatever its 12 forms that it could exist, it's, it's balderash, right? It's, it's, it's basically, a, it, it says, we should, it says we, should, we should all act according to self-interest, but it doesn't take self-interest to its natural conclusion. <clears throat> it kind of covers over the real conclusions of self-interest. So we either need to develop a science that properly delimits self-interest, so like the science of Marxism, right? or, or, or we need to just develop a society that, and where the powerful truly rule, a kind of fascism. Now actually many Marxists in the 19th and early 20th century, they were committed to some notion of material justice. <clears throat> All the way down to like Maybe John Paul Sartre, yeah, even John Paul Sartre, like in as much as he was a Marxist or a communist, right, was committed to some notion of material economic justice. Now, <clears throat> the figure, therefore, that we, and so I, so I think one of, the, one of the defects that we see in a lot of public discourse these days is people say, oh, we need to be concerned about those Marxists. There's Marxists marching in the street, or people are using Saul Alinsky tactics, right, to to undermine this, that, or the other thing. <clears throat> and I think what people fail to account for is how Michel Foucault, and that's the person we need to be introduced to, and we, made, we need to make sure we know about him, right? I think what they fail to understand a lot of times is the way Michel Foucault entered the scene and how Michel Foucault essentially changed the nature of the contract, especially between the education and educational and the political system. So that in a way, if, you, if, we, if we go back to our initial description of societies, how, how you know, societies are shaped by leaders, well, I think you can say, you can look at Michel Foucault and you can say, he definitely was a leader in the, in the educational sphere by the 1980s. And he was promoted 
by the political leaders, by, by key political leaders through the funding mechanisms and the grant mechanisms to be a, to be a key leader in the future formation or the future shape of the, especially of the humanities and the social sciences. Such that to this day, you know, when I was in graduate school, 80, 80%, 80 to 90% of the dissertations of political theory were not written under the theoretical lens of John Rawls. <laughs> they were written under the theoretical lens of Michel Foucault, right? Along with that many uh, dissertations in the humanities, especially literature, but also in anthropology and in the social sci- and the other social sciences. Now, so as to confirm this, <clears throat> I, was, I was having this discussion driving home from a retreat last fall, or last, sorry, in February. <clears throat> and so I was kind of going through this, going through this explanation. And one of the guys in the car said, I, said, I think I said 80%, like, or 75% of the dissertations. And one of the guys in the car said, I can't believe that. That's impossible. And there was this quiet guy who was on the retreat. He actually lives in Hope, Michigan. His, uh, his dad's a philosophy professor at Hope College. But so he's a, he's a, he's kind of a, he's a sophomore who was TAing senior math classes at Harvard. <laughs> he was the TA for senior math classes. But anyway, he has, on his little iPhone, he had access to some database on dissertations in the humanities. And he very quickly did research. And he said, well, actually, you were wrong. He said, he said to the driver, you were wrong. <laughs> right? It wasn't 75%. It's, like, it's more like 80 to 85%. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> to this day, right? To this day. I think he was saying last year. Last year, that was the case. So <clears throat> we're going to do a little reading here from the Book of Logos. But just to give you a sense here. So basically, the idea here is that Foucault came of age, he was born in 1926 in France. And he grew up, he grew up going to Mass, he was a Catholic. And uh, when he says, one of the, he says that one of the disturbing instances of his youth, which drove him to homosexuality, was seeing his father, who was a, a doctor, amputate a leg from a man, from another man. <clears throat> This, this somehow convinced him that his father was a violent man. And it, it led him to believe that the, that the state, the Enlightenment state, he led him basically to detest the Enlightenment state, according to his biographers. And all of his biographers are huge fanatics, so they're not, they wouldn't be like prone to make these kind of stories up. And if you want, I can give you footnotes just to, just to show and so from a young age then, and we, I, we, I don't know all the details here, but from a young age, he did become an active homosexual. He also from a young age began regularly committing suicide. Uh, att- regularly attempting suicide, yeah. Regularly attempting suicide. <clears throat> In fact, by the end of his life, by the end of his life, Foucault would habitually defend everyone's right to kill himself. He considered suicide the simplest of pleasures, he also considered his homosexual actions a preparation for death. This guy's weird. He entered into uh, he entered into existentialist circles in the '60s, <clears throat> and uh, actually, by the late '60s, Jean-Paul Sartre realized that Foucault was essentially making a move to supplant him as France's preeminent philosopher. <clears throat> one of one of one of um, one of in, in one of Foucault's last essays, he he writes, for example, instead of marrying the opposite sex, homosexuals marry death. But they are just as incapable of dying as they are of really living. Homosexuals and suicide discredit each other. Who, Foucault, as a young man, became immersed in the writings of Nietzsche of the Marquis de Sade, the great theorist of the French Revolution, from whom we get the word sadism. I have a nice story about that when the time comes. And Georges Bataille. Georges Bataille was a sociologist of the 1930s who did a lot of studies of patients who suffered from venereal diseases, who were blasphemers, who were libertines, and of course homosexuals. (laughs) 
who were basically mad. And Bataille tried to come up with a kind of a religion of madness. So Foucault, one way to understand Foucault is that if, if Bataille came up with, with, with the religion, Foucault, Foucault came up with the philosophy to rationalize that religion. And so Foucault as a young scholar became fascinated with madness. <clears throat> he became convinced that the only, that that it was important to study the tenets of the madhouse because it was their sins of unreason that brought them there. Madness is true knowledge because it is useful knowledge. Madness, if properly used, can overturn the, th- the therapeutic order of the, of the enlightenment state. It could bring about, and this is now quoting from Rousseau, or from Rousseau, Quoting from Foucault, the reign of Satan, because it is forbidden knowledge, it anticipates at the same time the reign of Satan and the end of the world, the final bliss and the ultimate punishment, the almighty power on earth and the infernal downfall. Victory belongs neither to God nor the devil. It belongs to madness. So he called, his, these ideas bring, come to a culmination in 1968, his book, Madness and Civilization. In that book, he advocates drugs, homosexual, any, anything that leads to madness, basically. <clears throat> he launched a group in 1971 called The Group for Acquiring Information on Prisons. This group basically set up a, a research not only to study prisons, but also to come up with ways, he says, and here's, I'm just quoting now, coming up with an institutional objective, nothing less than the demolition of modern society as a cohesive, integrated totality. The unity of society is precisely that which should not be considered except as something to be destroyed. And then it must be hoped that there will no longer be anything resembling the unity of society. In order to bring about this disunity, an unconditional war, an agon, for those that like Greek, needs to be gauged, engaged against the oldest laws and pacts. Such that traditional moral beliefs restraining the will to power will melt away. If these, view, if these views cannot be brought down through a bloody civil war, they can at least be weakened by pacific, by sometimes pacific and sometimes local agitation groups. The ultimate goal of these interventions is not to extend the visiting rights, for example, of prisoners to 30 minutes or, or, or procure cleanliness for the toilets, but it's actually to learn how to question the social and moral distinction between the innocent and the guilty. What happened in the next, so then th- these, these researches led to his 1975 book, Discipline and Punish. <clears throat> in this book, Foucault will then encourage his followers to be cruel, right? Be cruel in your, and then he goes on to describe sadomasochism which I'm not going to describe here. You can read it if you want. Because if you, do, if, you, if you engage in this behavior, you will feel the savor of disintegration and the humiliation of the self in the jouissance of exploded limits. You will invent new possibilities for pleasure through the eroticization of power. A kind of chaos. You will give birth to a kind of chaos and you will give birth to a dancing star. The dancing star in Latin is disaster. For those who like to know Latin roots of words. What's unique though about, so on the one one hand you could say, well, this is just the the trajectory of the Marquis de Sade to Nietzsche to Foucault. But Foucault added another another angle to all of this, especially when he came to the United States. 
So essentially, Foucault wanted to see the fall of the what he termed the ancient regime to give freedom to homosexuality or to any anything that's considered a, de- a deviant behavior. Let's say before <clears throat> 1968. But when he starts to real, I think what Foucault started to realize after 68 is that he could basically make a pact to create the new left. And so he, he came up with a way of supplanting the this, this Satrian communist existentialists who believed, yeah, you can create your own existence and whatnot. But they did, they did at least publicly believe there's some notion of material justice that we're striving for. <clears throat> so the way Foucault figured out a way to basically acquire complete pleasure for himself and those madmen like him so long as it's related to death, was by coming to Berkeley. <laughs> so he comes to Berkeley in 1975. His, his biographers say at that point he made, a Pauth, uh, he made a Faustian pact with the death instinct in the hecatombs of his fascist adventure by visiting the bathhouses of uh, San Francisco. But the other thing he does at this point is he, when he comes to Berkeley, is he starts teaching libertarian economics. So he has his students start learning, start reading and writing and considering, especially the writings of von Mises and von Hayek. <clears throat> he asks his students to read with special care the, collect- the collected works of Ludwig von Mises and Frederick Hayek, these distinguished Austrian est- economists strident yet prescient critics of Marxism, apostles of a libertarian strand of modern social thought, rooted in the defense of the free market as a citadel of individual liberty and a bulwark against the power of the state. So essentially, the, the, contra- the new contract that Foucault is trying to forge, as one, as one Foucaultian fo- fo- is, 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 a, is a contract that will be truly libertarian. It'll be both socially libertarian, allowing for LGBT madness rights, but it'll also be politically libertarian. And Foucault consciously sees this as preparing for sacrificial death. And so by the end of the 70s, as one author puts it, the left, following Foucault, Foucault, had become thoroughly defeated by the system that it had so, for so long antagonized. This adaptation of French speculative reverie, Bataille and Foucault, yielded a hybrid which seems to have so far incapacitated the critical and analytical faculties of students and scholars under its sway. This was postmodern political correctness working cheek by jowl with administrative capitalist authoritarianism. This was something new. <clears throat> and then now we know for sure, actually I know, so, so basically, just to illuminate the point, just to give one other quote here, maybe a few other quotes. Foucault's theory of power has become the cornerstone of much public discourse in America. I would add, I think there are, there are many who don't, know, don't realize this. They're speaking a discourse. They don't know the origin sometimes of their discourse. From academia to government by way of educational curricula. Since the successful launch of Foucault of a quarter of a century ago, that he's referring to the 1980s, his philosophy has come to be adopted as the idiom of America's intellectual elite which they have taught to the political elite. This brand of postmodernism has become the state-sponsored factory of political correctness in America. It has also become the exclusive voice of reason and tolerance in higher education. Much to the delight and the amazement of the capitalist elites, the free market is the only thing left after everything else has been deconstructed. (laughs) 
While the modernists carry on business as usual, telling their pupils that life is a game of chance in which the market alone can make them at the top, the postmodernists, following Foucault, reach conclusions not altogether dissimilar. Postmodernists invite their classes to apply relativistic exercises and deconstructivist techniques, whereby the students are made to take part in take apart a narrative and identify the social prejudices informing the text. But after the, de the deconstruction has crushed all the idols, the class has in fact no option but to fall back upon whatever is the current system of belief, that is, the creed of self-interest and faith in the free market with which every Anglo-Saxon is raised. <clears throat> and so what happened, how did this come about? The way this came about is that in the early 1980s, there were there were key members. There were key members of the 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 uh, the business elite and the governmental elite that I think realized what Foucault was doing, and they therefore dumped a lot of money into foundations that would in turn pr promote Foucaultian ideas in the major universities. <clears throat> and one such place that did that was a university not far from here. Maybe, no, 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 no. You got to go the other direction. You got to go the other direction. And as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, uh, the, one of the lead, there were two, there were two principal leaders, uh, intellectual leaders of the promotion of the editing of both Foucault's corpus and promoting his ideas and also the, the ideas of Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci is important because he was, a, he was a Marxist that essentially said, forget about economics, let's just go for the culture. <laughs> right? So Gramsci and Foucault go very well together. But basically, yeah, so one, one the, the two guys that did this, one was an ex-Jesuit who came from Malta, whose name was, it still is, Joe Buttigieg. And then the other one was a philosophy professor named Gary Gutting. <clears throat> and so essentially... These fellows were part of this effort that you see that starts in the late 80s. And also now we have, now, they, now there are articles that are, you can look, you can find them. They're very interesting articles for people who like conspiracy theories. Because these articles basically show the figures who were involved in the foundations and in the government, who were basically, and the memos back and forth where they chose Foucault as the philosopher that would bring about the project that I just described to you. Like, and they, they realized he was the perfect combination of, of because Foucaultian power, basically Foucaultian ideology is an ideology that enables you as the activist to identify and to label anybody in the periphery even as a potential source of, the, of a growth of power. And therefore it allows you to go after that person. If you can identify somebody as part of power, and, and ironically in, in Foucault's life, the, anything connected with the Catholic Church is associated with power, <laughs> right? But, it, but if, if you can identify them as power, that gives you a right as a madman to take them down, right? That's Foucault's philosophy, put into action. So... <clears throat> So, I, so I, now just think about this. I mean, I, I've done this so many times in my life where I go to somebody's house for dinner and we start talking philosophy and politics and whatnot. And then their, their junior high and high school boys come to the dinner table and they just sit there and listen. They don't say anything. They just sit and listen. Sometimes they play around or whatnot, but they're, listen, you know, they're listening. They're getting all their ideas. Well, <clears throat> I, I hate to say this, but do you, do you have any guesses who Joe Buttigieg is? Son that, might have that, been. That, that <laughs> no, very good, very good. Yeah, that's, that's right. So, <laughs> so the thing, the thing that's interesting is that I, I mean, I can just imagine now, Joe Buttigieg and Gary Gutting with their Foucaultian and Gramscian colleagues, sitting there in Marquette. We can go to his house. Maybe that would be an interesting excursion, <laughs> right? We can go to the Buttigieg house and see where it took place. But, but I, I mean, not, not, this is not to pick on that one particular politician, because, but it's just to say that, you know, little, little Pete Buttigieg went to Harvard, became a Rhodes Scholar, right? Went to, went, Rhodes Scholars are the people that train. The purpose of the Rhodes Scholarship is to train the future leaders of America, 
and hope that they remain there, they keep their cultural contacts with England. And then, then he goes into the military, and when he goes into the military, he goes into military intelligence. And he, his big thing was Afghanistan, right? He spent these years in Afghanistan. He comes out of the military, and basically the, he, he conspires with the faculty at the local university to become mayor of South Bend. And then somehow, he's a known quantity at the New York Times, and the New York Times starts promoting him as the first president of his, you know, of his kind, right? <clears throat> this, this, and this happened already, I think, in 2017. After he won a, an, an election in South Bend to become mayor, in which 8% of the people voted. <laughs> that would not be a valid election in Bosnia. <laughs> but, you know, the UN would not stamp that as a valid election in Bosnia. But, but <clears throat> the whole point of this is just to say that you can, you can I, I think it's a very illuminative example of how what's happened in his case has happened in hundreds of other cases between from the mid-1980s to the present, right? So it's just an example to try to show that you can see how there's the emergence of a new, you know, there's, a, there's really an attempt to make a new social contract along Foucaultian lines. Just as, at the, just as in the opening days of the French Revolution, there was really an attempt to try to make a new contract following the lines of the Marquis de Sade, which, is, which I think essentially is the, the schema that's outlined by Thrasymachus in Book One of the Republic, which is the powerful <clears throat> are the ones who set the terms of discourse, right? And the weaker, so, so what is justice? Well, justice is what, I mean, the whole point of the Foucaultian project, as I quoted it, is to break down any, so what is, what is defined as, as power is any institution that holds back the will to power from expressing itself. And Foucault developed an incredible rhetoric for coming up with a way to identify those nodes of power so as to justify breaking, breaking them down. 